it's Denise from Women Beyond a Certain Age. I'm very excited about our guest today. I don't really know our guest today. I know her from Facebook and from her books. So this is very exciting to me. And her name is Ramin Ganesham. Did I just butcher that? Ganeshram. Ramin Ganeshram. Well, Ramin, welcome. Hello. It's so lovely to meet you. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Now, I'm pretty sure we did not know each other from IACP or anywhere else, have we? No. No. Okay. No. We have many mutual friends. I know that. Correct. Okay. Yes, very true. Well, thank you for joining us today. I, I wanted to have Ramin on because I had read your book, The General's Cook, or I bought your book some time ago. And Ramin, if people don't know her, has been an author, a journalist, a cookbook author. But I'm focusing today on your novel. And mm -hmm. I know it came out a few years ago, but if there was ever a time for it to be relaunched, this is it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, it's so outstanding. So, and I think, well, I mean, that I had, I, I know I bought it when you, it first came out. I found it on my bookshelves, but it's so impressive. I can't say enough nice things to you. I mean, Thank I'm, you. I'm fangirling because it's called The General's Cook. And I put it up on Facebook yesterday saying that you were going to be coming today as a guest. And a, a lot of people that are my friends have, have all been personal chefs or caterers or food stylists. Most of the people that listen to this podcast are all food women. Mm. So I know that they will, if they missed it the first time, they'd be thrilled to read it now. Now, it's an undertaking. It's a novel. And... I need you, Ramin, to tell people, you give us your two or three sentences of what the novel is about. Sure. So um, what I always like to say to people is that it is a novel that is 90% true, and the, but yet it's a novel. And the reason is the, the subject, the hero of this book is a man named Hercules Posey. We now know his last name was Posey because of research. I did with a colleague at the History Museum where I'm the director a few years ago and after this book was published. Um, but he was the enslaved chef of George Washington, President George Washington. It's, I have to tell you, first of all, and of course, everyone's always heard about Thomas Jefferson and the, you know, uh, James Hennings. James Hennings and his Sally, his sister. But I had never heard about, I had never heard of Hercules before I read your book, okay? Now, which goes to show you, that, and I went to good schools and I studied history. So it's kind okay. of amazing to me that it's taken so long for this, for this story of Hercules. It's a page turner. It really is. And I know Thank you. all the things, I mean, that you put in the book, one, you've got, um, autobiographical notes in there, you've got historical notes in there, you've got questions for a book club. It would be a wonderful book for a book club. Um, and I'm just amazed at, and I know how many years, but you tell us how many years did it take you with the research to write this book? Uh, it took, between the research and the writing, it probably took about five or six years. Um, and I continue to research him. So I've actually been working, researching him and, re and sort of rebuilding his life. I continue to do it. Now it's been 12 years and the work oh, goes on. Okay. Yeah. Now this is an impress. This is impressive because it show at first of all, I think that perseverance and determination are the two most important qualities that people have in life. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I mean, personally, people I, say, I don't understand. I was a food stylist for a while, or I was a caterer for a while, but it was really hard and I quit. You know what I said? Yes, uh -huh. Yeah. But if you want a career, if you want to do something, if you want to make money, you have to keep at it no matter how difficult it is. Very so um, for you to be able to say that you've spent 12 years researching and growing with Hercules, really, would people have known about Hercules if, except for you? It's a good question. I mean, there are other scholars who who have done work uh, around him and mentioned him. I have to really give a shout out to my colleague, Craig Laban from the Philadelphia okay. Inquirer, 
This okay. is credit from the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer, a fellow Columbia journalism alumni to me. Um, and he very early on, um, when they were first kind of excavating the president's site and president's house site in Philadelphia, which is the house Washington lived right. in and Hercules was there with him, really started to write about him and um, explore him. And, you know, the other person who really has done a lot of work in the scholarly realm is Mary Thompson, who is a, a historian at Mount Vernon and who has consistently lifted up the stories of enslaved people, even at a time 20, 30 years ago when, you know, that wasn't the done thing, especially at places like Mount Vernon. So I'm not the only one, but I would have to say I'm the person that has the greatest obsession with him. I've never, ever given up on, on telling his story. He's always very near to my thoughts, even when I'm I, doing other obviously. things. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, this is a person, are you married? I... <laughs> I am married. Well, I'm married. And so your second husband is Hercules. <laughs> it's true. It's funny. My my friend, my good friend, uh, the 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 children's book series author Lauren Tarshis, who does a very very popular historical series of books called the I Survive series. She has for twelve years called Hercules my eighteenth century boyfriend. So it's Absolutely. your eighteenth century boyfriend today. <laughs> I think it's, oh, I think it's, abs see, I'm all for, um, th this to me is a healthy obsession. <laughs> there is, to, to really, to study something, I think is absolutely, I mean, to me, that's where, the reason I loved being a food stylist, Ramin, was because, we, every week it was something else, do you know what I mean? Right. If there was a new book out and we did the tour, I learned all about vegan food when the very first vegan cookbook, we would study things. If a, a big cake book came out for someone like Rose Birnbaum, I might fly, you know, I was hired here in LA. We learned, you know, we studied that book for a week. We made her cakes. So being a food stylist when you're busy, it's a lot of research. Yes. Yes. I and do. you learn something new every day. Do you know what I mean? That's absolutely. I think food for me, researching and studying food. And when we created recipes, that's been an obsession. Do you know what I mean? Otherwise yes. I couldn't have done it for 40 years. No, sometimes, yeah. You know, and sometimes my husband would say to me, aren't you tired mm -hmm. <laughs> of mm -hmm. reading about food? I'd say, no, not one bit. Not one he, bit. Right. Not one bit. Now, what about you? You talk about Adrian Miller's, the president's uh, kitchen cabinet. cabinet. Yes, kitchen cabinet, um, which I haven't read, but I do know who Adrian Miller is. So that's going to be when I finish oh, oh, Hercules this week. When I finish your book, I'm going to read his. Um, again, I think so much of history, as you were just saying about Ma Mount Vernon. I think so much of history has just been whitewashed and no one has, this hasn't been brought to the forefront. That's all. One of my favorite things because of the, I mean, because of working for PBS and for several years and working in, you know, how I got started in television, um, working on cooking shows was when I worked at PBS, everyone knew about Lena Richards. Lena Richards was a, a, a caterer from New Orleans, a black woman. She was so successful and she had the first PBS cooking show. Okay. Now, and yet, and I have her cookbook because I, when I was working at PBS, I said, who is this? Everybody said, oh, she was famous, but not famous, really. Do you know what I mean? And everyone always talks about Julia Child, the first TV chef. That's not true. Not true at all. Though I worked with Julia and I love Julia. There's just been so much of history that has been um, whitewashed and just not brought to the forefront, which is why I think it's such an exciting time. Yes, you're, you, you know, you're hundred percent right. And I think that, you know, as a historian, and as I said, I'm the executive director of a history museum in Connecticut, where I now live, um, the truth of the matter is that American history has always been told as a Euro American history and everybody else are ancillary players. But yes. the truth is that America was built as a company store, if you will, you know, to develop resources, not the least of which was the labor of human beings and the Atlantic trade. So, so enslaved people, indigenous people, later immigrants, 
are fully intertwined in the story of America. It, they're not, you know, drop in, you know, supporting actors in a play. You know, we're all actually intertwined actors in this play and our stories have been sub- subverted, right? Yes. So uh, really, I think, you know, myself and a lot of other historians, by just telling the truth uh, with ample primary source material to back it up, what we're trying to do is reposition the way American history, culinary history in this case, is viewed. You know, these are not, I always say about Hercules, his story is remarkable, uh, but at the same time, it's not remarkable, right? You know, it's it's remarkable to us because we haven't heard of him and it seems so unusual, but the truth of the matter was skilled Black cooks who worked in these homes really were um, the norm in many yeah. cases, you know, and what was remar- remarkable about him is that who he worked for or who he was enslaved by. Let's really be honest about that. That's right. And uh, the, the level of his artistry under oppressive conditions, right? And yet he really, you know, he was famous in his own time, as I think you gleaned from my book. Absolutely. That's not an exaggeration at all. He was well known in his own time for his skill. How did, so tell me, you mentioned Columbia. Mm-hmm. So how did you, how did your career progress to where you are now a historian and the executive director in Westport. How did that happen? Yeah, so essentially um, what happened was, you know, I was a news reporter. I was a regular freelancer for the New York Times regional sections. I wrote feature news stories. And um, personally, I was always interested in food history. And the reason is because I, my own background is somewhat unusual. My father was from Trinidad and Tobago. My mother was from Iran. They met in Brooklyn. I'm born and raised <laughs> in New York City. You know, um, in New York being, of course, such a cultural crossroads. And so, um, and you know, I, I'm 53. So when I was growing up in the in the 1970s and 80s, you know, it was still a time where people were asked to assimilate or forced to assimilate. You know, you didn't really express your culture outside of the house. And so my parents being from two disparate cultures, you know, English, of course, is the language of Trinidad, but it's the second language for my mother. Really, the only way that they continually expressed their culture was in what they cooked. And my father, this is kind of a roundabout way of answering your question. My father would always tell stories about his, his, his background when he cooked. So he was cooking and as a way to like reach back into the comfort of home. And I kind of in my head, I put it together that if people are cooking or eating or sharing food, this is when they're going to tell the best stories because there's such an emotional connection. So even as I worked as a reporter, I was interested in this idea of food as an access point to cultural history. But in those days, uh, food writing was not a thing, really. There were a few people who were doing it, Molly O'Neill, and there were a few people, obviously, in history, MFK Fisher Fisher and Clementine Powell-Bird and so on, James Beard, obviously. But at that period of time, if you were a woman and you were a reporter, serious reporters didn't do food writing. You didn't write recipes. That was for housewives or for the elderly ladies who still read the food sections of newspapers. And so I was actively discouraged from doing that because I was fortunate enough to be seen as a skilled and up and coming and award-winning news reporter. Um, So what happened to me actually was um, I started still doing it as I progressed in my career for whoever would let me do so as a side gig, um, including New York Newsday. But it was never a thought that it would be a full-time profession and no matter what, I always defaulted to food history, food culture, food history. I did ingredient stories. I did chef profiles. I did those things, right? But I was always defaulting to this idea of talking about people and their culture and their history and their food. Well, like a lot of New Yorkers, um, when 9-11 happened, I was working as an editor in a business magazine. And I decided, I don't, you know, I don't want to do this. I want to do what I want to do. Uh, and so I quit. And I went to culinary school Uh, and I went to culinary school for only one purpose, not to really work in restaurants, although I did that. I did it so that I, when I spoke to people who were experts 
I wouldn't be a fool. Like I would know what I could speak the same language, right? Um, Great plan. Um, that I could, <laughs> right. <laughs> and so that's what I did. And from that point on, I just kept writing about food and writing about food and culture. The turning point for me was when I wrote my first cookbook, which was actually a book about Trinidad, about my father's country. And, and completely without a plan, I wrote that book and the reviews came in saying that it was equally a cultural history book as a, as a cookbook. It was equally a travelogue. One person said it's a love letter to Trinidad, right? Oh. And from that point, um, I realized I didn't intend to do it. And then I realized, no, but that's actually, that's what I want to do. And that, that was kind of it. And so culinary history kind of dovetailed into just a love of history. It's really because of Hercules, because as you see in the General's Cook, there's so much detail. The only way that I could do that was to research not just him, but everything around him. The city of Philadelphia, the politics of the time, George Washington and Mount Vernon. Uh, even the weather in the book is accurate because I found a primary source of a person mm. who's a weather buff who kept notes about the weather. Um, and, you know, the social history of the United States. And so the 12 years of working on this is really what took me also out of culinary history into history at large. And my focus is really the 18th century, early 19th century history of African-Americans and mixed race people in America. Very impressive. I mean, very impressive. I certainly understand this. My grandfather and my father were both born in Italy and they settled in San Francisco, immigrants. Growing up, you know, we went from being immigrants to very, the mid fifties, the white middle class. Do you know what I mean? Right. I'm really yeah. the white middle class. And so the only reason we really knew we were Italian was because of the food that we ate. And right. of course, in the fifties, people were not open and lovely and said, oh, what great food. I mean, people, I remember wishing my last name was Smith. I just wanted to have a last name that was easy for people to pronounce, that yeah. didn't have all the vowels in it, that people would not make negative comments. Do you know well, what I'm I mean? With you, yes. I had the same because <laughs> yes. they did. They did make yes, negative of course comments. They did. Yeah. And of course, my mother not being born Italian. So she gave us first names like Joan, Anne, and Denise, our names, because she said, I wasn't sticking you girls with some name like Angelina, <laughs> along right. with that last name. And I, then when all my cousins, of course, had names like Angelina or and they, Michael, Michael Angelina, I mean, everybody had Alina in their name and I loved them, but I did know that it was going to make it, you know what I mean? That, that for some reason, people would make fun of that. Well, it's true. And, I, and it's, I'll tell you, I, uh, I had the same experience. And, I, and you know, I, I, when I had my daughter 16 years ago, uh, my husband has an Italian last name and now that's okay. But I remember being very clear, like, I don't want to give her a super quote unquote ethnic name, you know, Trinidadian name or Iranian name, because um, I don't want people to do to her what they did to me. Like I thought I would think I would resent my parents thinking you couldn't give me an American name for my first name. Like the last name is bad enough. You couldn't like go with like Amy or something, something, Amanda. <laughs> Amanda, something. So, you know, for them, they were just, you know, being um, immigrants from places that were not, there were not huge groups of those, either of those groups at the time in the 60s and the 50s. You know, they didn't really have anyone to guide them in that way. One of the parts, and I, when you've been talking, so as you've integrated your, lo your love of history and Hercules and, I've been, I have been in the Caribbean a lot. I mean, I've, I've been to Trinidad, I've been to Haiti, I've been to Bermuda. I, I mean, the only place I really haven't gone is Cuba. And I wish I had had, during the time that there was an opening, yeah. I wish I'd gone. But I, I taught, you know, on Holland America line for 14, 15 years. So one of the big runs is always the Caribbean. 10 days in the Caribbean, and I was in the entertainment uh, division because I taught cooking classes, and that went under entertainment. So I've been to the Caribbean a lot. So I learned 
different types of food on different islands because I'd have the whole day off to go into the markets. Do you know what I mean? And in the very beginning of your book, you talk about a pepper pot stew that Hercules is making a pepper pot stew. And it like all came back to me. And also because I had a client that used a lot of yucca, yucca. We, yes. Cassava. cassava. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. So when I, then after I read it in your book, I, I could taste it. Do you know what I mean? I thought I could taste it. Well, now, you know, is that, a, go ahead. Sorry. No, is that something that you would cook? Did you ever eat that as your family or was I? Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. Of course. And so in, in that opening scene, actually, uh, that you're referring to, Hercules goes to the public market and he interacts yeah. with a woman named Polly Hain, yes. who was a, who was a real person. And a pepper pot vendor in the, in the Philadelphia market was very famous, actually became quite, you know, a well off selling pepper pot. She and another woman named Flora Claville. And the reason is that pepper pot was sort of like the city food of Philadelphia in the 18th and 19th century via the Caribbean. Right. Wow. And yes, pepper pot is something that we do make. We do eat. Um, we you know, I knew exactly what it was. Um, and of course, this is this is a product. This is a food that traveled with the Atlantic trade, the slave trade yes, from the Caribbean up to, to Philadelphia. So, uh, and I think this is a thing a lot of people don't really understand. Uh, historians know this is that the Caribbean is so also lockstep intertwined with the history of the United States, particularly the original 13 colonies, uh, because in many ways, the North American colonies were, were developed in support of the Caribbean colonies, which were really the more valuable colonies by the 18th century because of sugar. Yeah. Yep. Yep. No, it we're so intertwined. I think it's just but I think it's a wonderful time. I mean that people can learn new things. Unfortunately, um stupid people you can't teach them anything. <laughs> Most people. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm 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 sorry, it's 70 years old. Sometimes when I I read the New York Times now or anything, I just have to put it down because I think, how many stupid people are there in the world? I mean, it's shocking <laughs> to me. It's just shocking and depressing. But I I know this about pepper pot stew, and I thought about it reading your book. I've had pepper pot stew that was like the poorest of pepper pot stew. Do you know what I mean? Right. right. With tripe and um, really the the leftovers, you know, the and then I've had rich pepper pot stew where it was made yep. with beef and seafood. And so I just think that that was, and I was wondering if you in fact ever made it yourself because you, it, it's a wonderful description that you make. And the, the fact that I also think this is the part that I love about your novel and I love about history. When you go to the farmer's market now, and there's cottage, we have cottage industry laws in California that we never right. had before. You know, um, I was in catering for years. You had a commercial kitchen. Everything was licensed. Do you know what I mean? I mean, if you yeah. made anything in your home, it was illegal and you would be fined. And so I've seen changes, you know, the last 30 years in food. And I go to places and they're selling it. And they're, and it's wonderful. It's entrepreneurial. I love all of it. But it's kind of like they think they just invented it. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, yes. well, this is my grandmother's pot pie recipe and I'm selling them to people. And I want to say, well, your grandmother probably sold them. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's and right. her grandmother right. probably sold them. So there's so much about the food chain yeah. and the food trail that I think would interest more people. I Here's the example. And I mean, and I've tried to sell, I've tried to sell a history of food to the History Channel TV show 20 years ago. The market was this big. Do you know what I mean? I mean, the yeah. size of a walnut. And, and I had big money behind me. Mm. And they still looked at me and said, huh, right. who cares about this? Do you right. know what I mean? I, right. And w- then another show that, again, an excellent production company. And um, we were talking about the Spice Trail. And though I'm not an expert on that, I knew experts in those days from ICP. And I said, you know, if you've traveled, if you go to Africa, you're sitting at an African table and you know that that came right from India when, you know, either on a boat 
or mm-hmm. when they were building the railroads. I mean, it's so, you know, it, it's so apparent. And again, the blank stares, of course, you know why else, and this is totally a, not, not that I feel like male bashing today, but everybody in the room <laughs> in those days, I mean, were white men. Do you see yeah. what I'm saying? Of that course. ran the Discovery Channel, that ran PBS. So it's fascinating to me. And I'm actually, I have a show that I wrote during the pandemic. Um, it's all about women in the kitchen and women of color in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. We've gotten one or two nibbles, we'll see. And this was before High and the Hog has come out, though certainly not before. When High and the Hog first came out, when Dr. Harris, when Jessica Harris wrote that book, I was sitting yep. somewhere and I said to her, this is a TV show. I kept saying to her, this is a TV show. And she was so lovely. And, you know, she's very, really there. And nobody was saying anything. And so what was that? 25 years? And now yeah. it's on Netflix? 25 years? Yes. Yeah. Really? I mean, I think it's an interesting thing, right? It's just things have to have their moment. I, yes. I you know, I credit a lot of this actually um, having to do with the fact that there was that, you know, maybe, what is it, 10 years ago, the beginning of real historical dramas ex- exposing the life of, um, you know, African Americans, you know, it's yes. like 12 years a slave, right? Yes. And, and then ancillary to that, Lincoln and things like this, right? And so, and then the butler, and so yes. on. And so I think that that kind of cracked the door open. Yes. And at the same time, what was happening was, uh, frankly, food content was being exhausted you know how many like standard format cooking shows could you possibly run you know how many restaurant reviews were people willing to to read and so as this became exhausted um and and networks started to look for new content and then you know the interest in black history started to develop i think then it kind of created a perfect moment um that we're in now i think you know, as a historian, of course, for me, um, I think a lot of these shows, like, you know, for those who don't know, for those who love High and the Hog as a show, I would say to them, please read Jessica's book. Yes. Because it's so much more detailed. Oh, and yes. the history is impeccable. and The research is impeccable. And you're not going to get a tenth of what she has in that book. And the show, the show is amazing. You know, I love the show. Yes, um, you could not. In fact, Adrian used my research finding Hercules in the show. He talked about it uh, when he's in the show and he talks about what happened to Hercules. That's research that I did. My colleague, Sarah Krasny, here at the museum. Um, you know, so that was great to see it, you know, out there in a, in a big national forum. Um, but uh, again, you know, the, the work of historians is so painstaking and so detailed. <laughs> See, you um, have such, you have the right attitude for that. That's good for you. <laughs> I mean, good for you. I, 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 I think that's amazing. When you talk about, and I, I did know this, when I first got to Los Angeles in 1985, I'd graduated from the CCA. And I knew I didn't, when I went to school, or I mean, I knew I wasn't going to work in a restaurant. OK, I, and yeah. there were only five women in a class of like 400 people. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And mm-hmm. two of them dro- were kind of not dropped out. They dropped out. They said, uh, you know, they just said, I don't need this anymore. I don't need this shit. I'm going to go get it. Right. I'm going to go get a low paying job without this degree. Yeah. So it was this big. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The market was this big. But I knew what I wanted to do with it when I went to work in one or two restaurants because I knew I wanted to be in catering. I knew I wanted to give some of the world's most beautiful parties. That was my goal. And drink expensive champagne. (laughs) I have met my goals, you know, and get paid for it and get flowers after the party. So I I met my goals because that's why I wanted to go into catering. Um, And that's why I moved to L.A. from San Francisco because L.A. had has the award shows and had the weather for it, you know, so it all worked for me. But when I got there, I, my farm was Beverly Hills because I had a gorgeous commissary in Marina Del Rey. So we had yachts, we had locations. And in those days, it's the eighties, you know, I were all, all the money in the world seemed to have been in the eighties and now it's all disappeared, but there was tons of money. And 
there was the number one caterer in Beverly Hills in the 80s was a man named Marvin. And they just called him Chef Marvin. And he was a black man, who had, an African-American man, who had worked in the White House. So, and yeah. he was so mm -hmm. lovely. Oh, well, I got to talk to him on the phone. And he was so darling to me because I just called him up and said, you know, we've got, a, I've got a new company and Marvin, your name came, comes up all the time. I just want you to know that people say nothing but wonderful, you know, things about you. And I hope to be you one day. Do you know what I mean? I hope that people say the things that they say about you, about me. And he was absolutely charming. And then he told me a few stories about working in the white house. And of course it was, extraordinary yeah it's extraordinary i mean and i think the thing is you know talking about hercules for me you know my life's work in a, in you know sort of the underpinning of my life's work is to lift up his story right i just feel like till the day i die i have to do this work to make sure that people know him and here's why that you know we talk about the white house and we talk about uh, diplomatic dinners and we talk about these amazing chefs like chef marvin who yeah. who worked there to produce uh, this fabulous food across that is served on a table across which matters of state and ma matters of international importance are decided. Well, the person who created that methodology, the person who created what that would look like and feel like and taste like was Hercules Posey. He was the one. You cooked for George Washington. He created the Congress dinner that happened, you know, every uh, Tuesday. And, you know, the levies of Mrs. Washington that happened Thursday or it might have been opposite Thursday and Tuesday. And, you know, uh, it, when he met John Adams and Hamilton and Jefferson and Henry Knox, his cabinet, you know, over meals, Hercules prepared those meals. And he put together a table that showcased the best of, you know, English style cuisine and used all the bounty of America. And they got goods from Mount Vernon. So that showcased um, plantation cooking, Southern cooking, and it, Philadelphia was the major food port of America. So there was food from every one of the 13 states. They still do this in the White House. You know, they showcase yes. American food from all over the United States, from all the cultural influences to show this is who we are. We're diverse, we're bountiful, and we're still elegant. Hercules Posey created that standard. Got it. And it is still being copied today. Now, has anyone... Why hasn't someone made your The General's Cook into a TV movie? Everybody asks me this. Um, we I'm are sure. working on it. Yes, we are Good. working on it. Um, myself and, a, and a, uh, a very respected production company, is. Good. we are trying to work on that. Um, you know, these things take a long time. Um, they, you know, and it, you said it before. I mean, they take forever. They and it really forever. has to be, I mean, I have found more than a production company because I've worked with some of the best production companies, you know right. what I mean, in the world. You need to find a director producer that is so in love with Hercules that they want to bring it to the screen. Do you well, know what I, mean? I have to tell you something. So, you know, if anyone, anyone who's listening knows her. So um, I'll say who we want is Shonda Rhimes, who just moved to the town I lived in. I live in Westport, Connecticut. And I'm a great admirer of hers on many, many, many levels. Absolutely. I love the way that she, I mean, just besides the fact that she's utterly fabulous. I mean, what she did with Bridgerton, whether you care for, like, I'm not a romance type of person, but the fact that she made people obsessed with a period right. of history that seems so far afield from the American experience, that is brilliance, right? And so, um, and obviously uplifting characters of color, like I have great admiration for her and, you know, everyone's like, well, she lives in Westport. I'm like, what do you think I'm going to do? Walk up to her house? I'm not okay, yes. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I want you to hang up on this call. And I want you to Go stalk make her. some pepper pot stew. And I want you to walk up her door. I know. You, you literally. Now, I'm going to tell you something. And you know this. Because with your perseverance. Years ago, I mean, there was a thing called the Book of the Month Club. Okay. Yes. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm got the catalog in the mail. The woman who ran it was named Pat Adrian. And she used to come to ICP. She was wonderful. She had enormous amount of power because if she put your book in her catalog, you sold a ton of books. She was the pre-Oprah Oprah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and she 
I'd, I'd run into her once or twice at ICP. It's something we would meet. No big deal. Now, I write my first book and I, they, we were still faxing. I sent her a fax like every four days saying, will you <laughs> with a copy of my book? I sent her anything I had. Blurbs, anything I'd done. Complimentary letters from important people, whatever I'd done. From the parties that I'd given. I called her so much and her assistant that one day she grabbed the phone from her assistant and said, if I put your book in next month's catalog, will you leave me alone? <laughs> I'm not kidding. And I said, sure. <laughs> and the next month she gave me the end of the, you know how they had a thing that you filled out what you wanted in the, the little, how to yeah. order your book. And she gave me the flap that tore off that people could put in there. It was like a prime position. And of course I sold 10,000 books that month. Sure, sure. So I can't do it today, but I would walk up to Shonda Rhimes <laughs> doorstep <laughs> with you. And we would just act like we were, you we were just there by, did you? Like we belong right? there. <laughs> it's not, I'll tell you one thing. If Shonda Rhimes <clears throat> is like, I have cooked for Oprah several times. Oprah, you can get just about anything you want out of Oprah with a brisket. Okay. She, <laughs> she wants it. Well, Denise. Now you know what you have to do for me. I wish I, you, you know what? We didn't work. I'm trying to think of, did we work with Shonda for a Mariah Carey video? We might have. I don't remember. Oh, I'm, we were like this. I'm sure she'd remember me. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to tell you, you have so many things, I mean, that I didn't even get to yet. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you and hope you will come back again. And we can record a second podcast because you are just a fountain of information. Thank you. Thank I you. I cannot thank For you. For a historian, that's quite an quite a compliment. Thank I, you. <laughs> I, I really, really appreciate it. And it's one of my favorite things. When we started the podcast, people said, why are you starting the podcast? I said, because I want to speak to interesting women about whatever we want to. Uh, and they said, oh, appreciate and we've actually gotten one or two nibbles, nothing that was worth writing home to one or two, <laughs> no, you know, nothing, nothing to write home to about sponsors and stuff. But I keep like you, I they, things take a long time. I think somebody one day is going to write Cindy and I a big fat check and let us say whatever we want. And that'll be it. Your mouth to God's ear. I hope that happens. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm in this for the long run. So the generals cook. Our guest today, Ramin. And I'm so grateful to you. And if people want to reach Cindy and I, they go to womenbeyond at iCloud.com. All complaints go directly to Cindy because, <laughs> she, because I'm petty. Okay, so I, I know who I am. I don't like that. I don't like mean talk. But anyway, I thank you so much for your time. It was thank absolutely you. wonderful. And we're gonna hold, I'm gonna hold your book. I'm trying to think if I know, I know no one who knows Shonda Rhimes, <laughs> but I'm gonna put it out there to the universe. This is a match made in heaven. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much for your time. Thank you, Miss Cindy, pleasure. for everything you do. Cindy, if everybody knows, Cindy does everything. And I appreciate it, and I hope everyone is well. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.